In the last video, we met finite fields of prime order, and we saw that it was actually very easy to do addition and multiplication in those fields. It was just like ordinary addition and ordinary multiplication, except that you regarded two things as equal if they just differed by a multiple of your prime p. The problem was doing division. Like, for example, if you take the finite field of order 17, what's 1 divided by 12 in that finite field? You could work it out by trial and error, but we'd like to have a systematic way to do this, and that's what we're going to develop in this video. So to help us, what we need is what's called the division lemma, or the idea of division with remainder, which is something that you will have seen before. So it's just division where you get a quotient and a remainder. So we take two positive integers, x and y. So not elements of a finite field, just ordinary positive integers. And what division with remainder says is that you may not be able to divide x by y exactly, but you can divide it and get a quotient and a remainder. And if we call the quotient q and the remainder r, then the defining property of those are that x is equal to q times y plus r, and the remainder r is greater than or equal to 0 and strictly less than r. So let's just see some examples of doing quotients and remainders, so doing division with remainder. If you took x to be equal to 15, and you took y to be equal to 3, for example, then you can write 15 as 4, uh, as, sorry, as 5 times 3 plus 0. So this time your remainder was 0. So let's label what's going on here. This is the x, this is the q, this is the y, and this was the remainder. So that was, would be what would happen if the division worked exactly. On the other hand, if you had y is equal to 2, same value of x, and this time 15 is equal to 7 times 2, so 7 is the quotient, and you get a remainder of 1. And again, the remainder is strictly less than the number y that you were trying to divide by. Uh, on the other hand, if you had x is equal to 17, and you want to divide this by 5, you can't do it exactly, but you can say 17 is equal to 3 times 5, so a quotient of 3, and then the remainder would be 2. On the other hand, if you try to divide um, something by something larger than it, so let's say we had x is equal to 5 and y is equal to 7, well, you can always do division with a remainder, so we will always have 5 is equal to a quotient times y plus a remainder, which has to be something less than y, and in this case, we would have 0 times 7 plus a remainder of 5. So you can always do division with a remainder, no exceptions. As long as you've got two positive integers, you can always do this. Okay, so why do we need this? We need this because it is going to help us. We're going to use it repeatedly when we prove the following theorem, which says if you've got a prime number p, and if you've got a number a between 0 and p, then there are whole numbers s and t such that a times s plus p times t is equal to 1. So before we talk about why this is true, let's just look at why it's useful to us in our quest for multiplicative inverses in finite fields. And the reason why it is useful to us is as follows. Because if you found this, well then, in the finite field with p elements, what can you say about a times s? Well, a times s differs from 1 by a multiple of p because the difference between a times s and 1 is p times t. So a times s will be equal to 1 in the finite field with p elements. So if you can find this number s, if you can not just prove it exists but actually find it, well then you've solved your problem of dividing by a, because then 1 over a will be equal to this number s in fp. So that's why this theorem and the procedure we're going to develop when we prove the theorem is actually solves the problem of doing division in finite fields. So actually, I'm not going to give a full proof of this result. If you want to see the full proof, you can read that in the notes. Instead, I'm going to give you a special case which actually contains all the complexity of the main proof, but just is a little simpler to write down. So what we're going to do in our proof is we're going to do repeated division with remainder. So we're going to divide p by a. So when we do this, we get to write p is a quotient times a 
plus a remainder. And actually, since I don't want to do this a lot of times, I'm going to have lots of quotients and remainders. I'm going to give these numbers. So this is going to be quotient number two and remainder number two. So what can I say about this quotient and remainder? I know that when I do division with remainder, the remainder is going to be less than, strictly less than A. Okay, we're now going to continue and we're going to divide A by R2. So I get a new quotient and a new remainder, R3. So this remainder R3 will be strictly less than R2. So remember this, this new equation is what we got when we divided A by R2. Okay, now we're going to divide R2 by R3. So we get a new quotient and a new remainder. And the new remainder will be less than R3 because we divided R2 by R3. Okay, let's look at these numbers R2, R3, R4. So you'll notice that first of all they're all non-negative, they're all greater than or equal to zero. But secondly, A was bigger than R2, and R2 was bigger than R3, and R3 was bigger than R4. So these numbers are getting smaller and smaller and smaller, but they're always greater than or equal to zero. So eventually one of these remainders must be zero because they're strictly decreasing. So if you do this for A steps, then eventually you must get to zero. So let's suppose that um, the next remainder was the one to be zero. So let's say it happened at the next step, which would mean that when we tried to divide R3 by R4, what we got this was that remainder number 3 was equal to the next quotient times R4, and then the remainder was 0, so R4 exactly divides into R3, or to put it another way, R3 is a multiple of R4. Okay, what does that tell us about R4? So R3 is a multiple of R4, or R4 divides R3. So let's look at the next line up, this line here. So in that case, on the right-hand side of that equation, you've got two multiples of R4. You know that R4 is um, divides into R3, so Q4 times R3 is a multiple of R4, and R4 is a multiple of R4. So what we get this from this is that R4 divides R2. So let me just introduce that notation. So x and then this bar y means x divides y so y is a multiple of x okay so r4 divides r2 r2 is a multiple of r4 and then let's take an another step up so here we know that r3 is a multiple of r4 from that was that was what we look, got to begin with. We know that R2 is a multiple of R4. So both of the things on the right-hand side of that next equation are multiples of R4. So A is a multiple of R4 as well. Okay, and let's just keep going. One more step. We know that R2 is a multiple of R4. We know that A is a multiple of R4. So R4 divides P. Okay, it follows then R4 divides the prime number P. So R4 is less than P, it divides P, and P is prime, so R4 is equal to 1. Like the only divisors of a prime number are 1 and P. So R4 must be 1. Okay, let's do some rearranging. So I'm going to rearrange the last equation because I now know something about R4. I know R4 is equal to 1. So I'm going to rearrange my third third equation. So what do I get from that third equation? I get 1 is equal to R2 minus Q4 R3. Okay, I can do some more substitution. So I'm going to substitute for R2. That's P minus Actually, we don't need the brackets. P minus Q2A. 
minus q4 times, uh, what's r3? r3 is a minus q3r2. Uh, what's r2? r2 is p minus q2a. Okay, what have we got? Well, we've got um, what we have is a horrible mess, an awful mess. But if you look at all the terms in this horrible mess, then they're all either multiples of a or multiples of p. So this, I'm not going to work this out, but what I'd like you to notice is that if we multiplied this out, we would get something times p plus something times a. In other words, we have 1 is equal to a multiple of p plus a multiple of a. So this has not only proved that the s and the t in the statement of the theorem exist, but it's actually given us a way that we could calculate them. All right, so this might not look like a completely practical procedure for finding s and t given p and a, but I promise that actually it is. So let's try some examples because I want to convince you that this is genuinely a thing that you can very easily do uh, by hand. So let's work out what is, so I think this is the question I asked at the start, what is 1 divided by 12 in the finite field with 17 elements? So according to our recipe, what we've got to do is look for um, numbers s and t such that s times 12 plus t times 17 is equal to 1. And we know that the way that we should do this is just keep doing division with remainder. So we start off with 17 is equal to something times 12 plus a remainder. So what is it? It's 1 times 12 plus a remainder of 5. Okay, and then we just keep going. So we we divide 12 by 5. So 12 is 2 times 5 plus a remainder of, what's the answer? 2. Okay, we keep going. Now we're going to divide by 5 by 2. So 5 is going to be equal to 2 times 2 plus a remainder of 1. And now we can stop and rearrange. So now we just rearrange for 1 in terms of 17 and 12. But let's highlight, actually, before we do this, let's just highlight what this looks like because we have this 12 here and our 12, the quotient, that became the next thing which we divided by. And the remainder there, that became the thing you divided by and then it became the thing you divided. And then the 2 here, that became the next thing you divided by and then we stopped because we got a 1. Okay, so now let's substitute what's going on. So 1 is equal to 5 minus 2 times 2, which is equal to 17 minus 12 minus 2 times, where did we see a 2? So 12 minus 2 times 5. Okay, so what have I got? I've got 17 minus 12 minus 2 times 12 plus 4 times 5, and 5 is 17 minus 12. So if I gather together the 17s and the 12s, you can see that I've got five 17s and I have minus 1, minus 2, minus 4. I've got minus 7 12s. Okay, check that. Don't trust my arithmetic. But I think if you do, you will find that that's correct. So 1 is equal to 5 times 17 minus 7 times 12. Okay, so why did this help us? So in F17, multiples of 17 are equal to 0. So minus 7 times 12 is equal to 1. And if you like your, if you don't like this minus 7, well, in F17, minus 7 is equal to 10. So 10 times 12 is equal to 1. Both of those equations are true. And if we want 1 over 12, that will be equal to 10 or minus 7. Okay, so we've done a multiplicative inverse. We've done 1 divided by 12 in the finite field with 17 elements. Uh, let's do another just, just for fun. So let's do um, what is uh, 1 divided by 13 in, um, let's do F13, uh, let's do F17 rather. Uh, wouldn't make sense in F13 because 13 is 0 and you're never allowed to divide by 0. 
Okay, so what's this one then? We have to do more quotient and remain quotients and remainders. So we do 17 divided by 13, and that's 1 times 13 plus a remainder of 4. Okay, so we use the the, um, the old thing we were dividing by comes becomes the new thing that we divide. So 13 comes here, and now we're going to divide by 4. So that's 3 times 4 plus a remainder of 1. Okay, and actually we can stop already. We've got the 1 that we want. So 1 is equal to 13 minus 3 times uh, 4, which is 17 minus 13. So when I collect my 13s and my 17s, I get 4 times 13 minus 3 times 17. So in the finite field with 17 elements, 4 times 13 is equal to 1. Okay, 17 is 0, so we could ignore that minus 3 times 17. So let's just clear that up a bit. That wasn't very neat. 4 times 13 is equal to 1. Uh, so 1 over 13 is equal to 4 in the finite field with 17 elements.